uh, to really be here. Uh, in fact, it's a very special occasion for us in a number of ways. Uh, one, we are uh, uh, today really speaking about the shared value and of course, one of the very interesting projects that we are launching uh, and it's called the Social Progress uh, Index. Uh, in fact, the whole Social Progress Index is something uh, that Dr. LeBroy has been supporting us with. Uh, in fact, uh, it's a privilege that we are actually doing the project with Niti Ayo uh, as an institute for competitiveness, Niti Ayo uh, Social Progress Index, wherein we'll actually talk about progress within the states of the country, the districts and the cities. It's a fairly long drawn process which is going to be oh, done over the years, but something very, very exciting. But I think without further ado, Dr. Debroy has to leave uh, in the next uh, 20 minutes. Uh, but then I must just tell you that he's one of the foremost economists in the country. Uh, needs no introduction, member of the Niti IO. I think he is somebody who has actually done the whole idea of competitive federalism in the country and so on and so forth. But Dr. Debroy, over to you, sir. Please, thank you. Thank you, Amit, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. One of the problems a professional hazard of working with the government is you get invited to all kinds of places and get invited to speak at an inaugural session regardless of what the conference or the workshop is about and regardless of whether you have any particular expertise in that area or not. It's just a professional hazard. So I'm not very sure why Amit Kapoor has invited me here apart from the fact that he's generally kind to me. So I know absolutely nothing about what is going to be discussed. I know absolutely nothing about the agenda. So to, I do what I do generally, which is to follow one of the principles enunciated by Sir Humphrey Apple being advised to his minister, that you go and say whatever you want to say in any case which is what I propose to do. Just some straight thoughts on development and governance in India, which may or may not be relevant to what you will be discussing. I must apologize in advance because I've got a meeting, so I have to leave at 10. So just some stray bulleted kind of points. The first point is, that if you look at any cross-country comparison of governance, regardless of how governance is being defined, India does not do all that well. Doesn't matter what indicator it is, what ranking it is, what study it is, India does not do all that well. So there is a certain robustness about this. The second bulleted point is that whatever be that measure of governance, there is a correlation between governance however defined and the level of economic development however defined. But correlation does not necessarily imply causation. Causation happens in different kinds of ways while it is true that better levels of governance may improve economic development however measured. It's also true that higher levels of economic development stimulate the demand for better which leads me to bulleted point number three. There are plenty of definitions of governance that float around. Governance clearly is something that is different from government. 
If you look at all of these definitions of governance, a distinguishing feature is that governance involves participation. It's about the decision-making process. And the broader point that I'm making now is if governance in India is going to improve, if the indicators of social and economic progress in India are going to improve, they aren't going to improve because of what government alone does. Cannot happen. It happens only when citizens participate in the process. India becomes a better country only when citizens try to ensure that India is a better country. To give you two completely different examples, the Consumer Protection Act in 1986. Did that happen because the government legislated it? Not quite. There was citizen demand articulated through NGOs and civil society that there should be a Consumer Protection Act. Ditto for the Environment Protection Act in 1986. Ditto for the right to education. Ditto for the right to information legislation. Take the recent initiative of this particular government in terms of smart cities. What distinguishes smart cities from several other government attempts to rejuvenate urban governance like the JNNURM is that the smart city mission involves citizens. It is citizens who in conjunction with municipal bodies and state governments determine what smartness means for their particular city. So therefore, if you look at the top two cities, Pune and Bhubaneswar, the citizens of Pune have interpreted smartness in one particular way. The citizens of Bhubaneswar have interpreted smartness in a completely different way. So India is going to change only if all of us contribute to making India change. The next point I want to make is that there are several transitions that have not happened in India yet. India is still largely an informal, unorganized economy. I can draw a pedantic distinction between informal and unorganized, but I'm not going to do that. Let me just use those two terms synonymously. It's still largely an informal and unorganized economy. Depending on how you measure it, for example, if I use employment, Less than 10% of employment is in the organized sector. And when I say unorganized and informal, I don't mean only agriculture. That phenomenon of informality exists also outside the agricultural sector. There is a significant percentage of the population that is still employed in rural India. There is a significant percentage of the population that still earns a living from agriculture. There is a significant percentage of the population that is still in self-employment. Quite often when we think of governing India, when we think of things like social security, we try, we tend to assume there is an employer-employee kind of relationship. If one assumes India's workforce, oblique labor force, to be something like 450 million, only about 45 million are in any kind of formal employer-employee relationship. So it's important to bear these points in mind because I move on to my next point, which is a data issue. The data issue is not only about macroeconomic data. Macroeconomic data is somewhat easier. 
macroeconomic data like GDP, fiscal indicators, financial sector, those things are easier. With all the warts and blemishes, with a time lag of about 18 months, you get reasonable macroeconomic data. But the moment you're talking about anything else, you have a huge data problem. You have a huge data problem because you do not have a handle on entrepreneurship outside corporate sector manufacturing. You do not have a handle on any services beyond financial services which tend to be organized. You have virtually no handle on agriculture. If I'm going to move on to social indicators, indicators that are linked to, let us say, health and education, I have absolutely no idea about what is going on. Even if I'm going to talk about the roads that are being built, the roads, as some of you know, certainly the Indians know, there is a three-tire kind of structure. You have the na national highways. Below that, you have the state highways. Below that, you have the district roads. And below that, you have the village roads also. Beyond the national highways, I have no idea what is going on. Let me expand on this point a little bit. For a very, very long time, we have debated on the percentage of the Indian population that is below the poverty line, BPL. What has this debate been based on? This debate has been based on something called the National Sample Survey. Now note that word. It is a survey. It is not a census. A survey only enables me to form some kind of idea at some kind of aggregate level. It never enables me to do and identify what an individual is doing, what an individual household has or does not have. For the first time, and I hope you know about this, we have something called a SECC which is already being used by the government for the rural sector. The SECC is not a survey, it is a census. The SECC tells you exactly which poor household holds what and has what. So despite what I said about the data problems, Despite what I said about the informal, unorganized sector, we have the beginnings of some transition that are now happening. That is happening through things like the SECC, which of course is somewhat old, and one needs to figure out how it can be updated fast and made close almost real time. It's happening, that transition is happening through the Pradhan Mantri Jandhan Yojana accounts. You may read in the newspapers question marks about the Jandhan Yojana numbers. <coughs> Rather paradoxically and perversely, those questions are far more pertinent for the poor in urban areas. Rather perversely, the poor in India already have bank accounts. Whether they use those bank accounts or not is a different matter. But so far as their possessing bank accounts is concerned, they already have those bank accounts. You have an integration of that with the Aadhaar biometry already happening. You increasingly are going to have an integration of that with things like smartphones. But that transition is still happening. It has not happened. Let me now quickly turn to government. Quite often we tend to think that government means union government in Delhi. For most of the things we are talking about, the union government in Delhi is not quite relevant. It is relevant for foreign policy, it's relevant for defense, it is relevant for national highways, it's relevant for some policies, 
but the bulk of what happens in India is determined by states. Depending on the year, 90 to 95 percent of national income originates in states. And so far as delivery of public goods and services is concerned, it's not even the states. It is the local bodies. There have been several arguments, theoretical, non-theoretical, arguing India is excessively centralized in terms of governance. We have just begun to see the beginnings of not just fiscal devolution, but also actual decentralization. And the more that decentralization happens, not just from union government to state governments, which is obvious, but also within state governments down to local bodies, the easier it will be. Finally, at NITI, our job is very simple, reducing it to a simple level. Our job is to ensure that the life of every citizen in India improves, measure it using appropriate indicators, and track the, that improvement over a period of time. Everything that you will talk about, everything that you will do outside this, every initiative of yours also feeds into that process, because as I said, Government alone will not be able to do this. All of us wear multiple hats. So that was strand number one. Strand number two, our job is to ensure that entrepreneurship in India flourishes and there is an enabling environment for the entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur does not mean, as I said earlier, organized sector corporate manufacturing. It is entrepreneurs throughout India. I hope what I have said has some relevance for what he will be talking about, but these were just stray thoughts on the development and governance issue in India as I see it. Thank you once again for having invited me. Thanks, Amit.